So even a new baby artist that's just starting out, I would recommend they get an LLC. You know, you are going to limit your personal liability protection. You are going to get some tax benefits and you should have a business around your music business. And then I also think that we start developing what are these different areas of your music monetization? Are you signed up with a PRO? Do you know what the MLC and sound exchange are? Do you, all your songs that you've written, do you have split sheets? Do you have producer agreements with your producers? Is everything papered before you put music out? Before we even talk about anybody coming to the table with a potential deal, is everything pretty clean, cleaned up and tidy? What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brandman Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can stream us anywhere that you stream your podcast, YouTube, Spotify, etc. Here at the intersection of creativity and currency. And you know when we do this intro, we have a very special guest today. We have Ryan Schmidt of Bowen Schmidt <laughs> Entertainment Attorneys. We got to talk about the legal stuff because that is a huge deal and a lot of artists have been caught slipping lately, but we're not going to get into that just yet. First, I just want to start off. Ryan, appreciate you being on. Glad to have you, man. Thank you so much for having us, uh, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Man, it's always good to have, you know, a lawyer on. Right, we plan to have more of you guys on. If you if you like this, you know, this this whole flow, hopefully, you know, you come back uh, because there are a lot of topics we just don't touch on because, you know, that's not our business. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but there's a lot of real information that can help artists out there today. We got to start out with one of the topics that we were talking about right before the pod. Um, like artists don't know whether or not they own their masters. Right. There's there's, there's this thought. So, legitimate well-to-do successful executives have said that whoever pays for your masters owns your masters so if i go in the studio i lay down a track and then i take off and i say hey jacory can you pay for this um because i have some other things to do and jacory uses his own credit card pays for the masters apparently he owns the song that's what i've been hearing is is that correct no, that's not true. So it all goes back to copyright, right? Money alone isn't going to equal ownership. The Copyright Act says that whoever is the author, whoever creates an independent, protectable piece of work, whether that's lyrics, music, sound recording, they are the author and owner of that copyright, whether it's the master recording, whether it's the publishing and the music and lyrics, so this idea of money equals ownership of the master really comes down to a contract. You know, a, a company like a record label can't own just out of just from the gate, can't own a master because they aren't a creative. They aren't an artist. They can't record, right? They're just yeah. a company that holds a whole bunch of property. Yeah. But what they can do is they can enter a contract, which is a recording contract, if it's if we're talking about a label, that can say in exchange for money, in exchange for this advance, in exchange for me paying for this recording, you, the artist, are entering this contract that says, I, the label, am either going to own these masters or you're going to license the masters to me and I'm going to have the right to release it. So it's always money plus the contract because think about it this way if it's just the money there could be a lot of weird situations that end up that wouldn't be anybody's intent you know you've got a rich grandfather that gives you some money to go in the studio and record you've got kickstarter you know the crowdfunded thing you've got a a a bank gives you a loan where would where, where would it end at that point so just because somebody has paid for the studio time or somebody you know is giving you the equipment to use that doesn't alone equal copyright ownership and ownership of the master. I'm glad you said that because, you know, the more recent conversation is who paid for it. But I've also heard the other, like whoever owns the studio as well, like owns the master or whatever. So where does that come from? Like, what, what do you think the confusion is if that's just outright untrue? Because, again, there's some experienced people who believe this to be true. I think that it comes from industry standards and there's industry standards, of course. And then there's what the law says. And don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with certain ways of doing things and, and the way that the industry does things, but it just has to be 
you know, two consenting adults say, yes, I agree to that. You know, if somebody says to me, Ryan, look, this is my studio. I paid for this recording. I brought everybody in on this. You know, I want to own this master. Do you agree to that? And I say, yes, that's absolutely fine. But there just isn't a default rule of, you know, I'm, I'm funding this, so I'm going to own this. I'm glad you said industry standard, man, because that's a common term we like to throw around mm -hmm. in the industry, right? It's like, oh, this is a standard contract, but you just said standard doesn't necessarily mean law, right? Which also implies a lot of flexibility. And more and more artists are starting to realize, well, yes, that could be the standard per se, if that's even true, because you're just telling me this is standard. But... I don't have to go with said standard because I might be worth more or there might be aspects of this agreement that don't work for, for me. How do you view this term like standard as a lawyer, right? I'm sure you've acknowledged, hey, this is a standard contract in, in one thing or another. Well, for me, you know, the standard is the norm. And I think that that's baseline, right? Yeah. And the industry standard has kind of sucked for artists, right? And so standard isn't necessarily good. It's just the way that it's always been done. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a lawyer, as also an artist advocate, I try to keep pushing that standard to a more artist friendly place. But yeah, there are certain rules and percentages that you want to see in a deal. You know, if it's a management agreement and you know that a manager typically is going to take between 10 and 20% of what an artist brings home, you see a management deal that says 50-50, that's way outside of the standard. And, and, you know, we've got certain percentages like that that exist throughout the entire music industry. So there are, there are rules and there are standards. And when they go so far outside of that, that's where I usually have a big issue. Got you. Yeah, like even outside of music, I personally have had certain contracts where people will come to me um and we'll say hey this is what standard looks like if i want to be involved and to me i look at it as this is just information i appreciate that information you've now told me what is typical but that has nothing to do with whether or not that works for me mm -hmm. right but in some occasions it might be better than what i thought so i was like okay cool this is what standard is i love it but in some occasions it's like well that doesn't work for me so you know, we'll have, we're going to have to figure something out, but it is good to know where the baseline is. And, but, I, and I think acknowledging that flexibility, like you said, like standard isn't necessarily good. It's just, it's just a baseline is something that I would love more artists to take to heart because I've seen so many types uh, of agreements at this point. Right. You're, you could pretty much play with everything. Like, uh, because I follow a lot of entrepreneurs, I've always, um, I, it's been a while since I've learned about like just creative deal making, right? Because I came up in sales for a period of time and it's like, well, whatever makes it work. I, my standard deal, hey, if you want to sign up for this program, I don't know, $50 a month, okay? But this guy, he has a brand that I like. Maybe I say only $20 or maybe I say, hey, you get it for free. Right. But then we barter in some other other form of fashion and we get an outcome that we both desire. I think that I think artists should always kind of consider what are all your assets. Right. And if they know what all their assets are, then they'll probably understand better how to leverage those different assets. So if you could kind of speak to different types of deals or different levers that artists could pull outside of what might be perceived to be standard when doing a let's say label distribution and maybe even a management deal. Uh, it, I think that'll be pretty helpful for artists to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And just, just know like for the label type of, of deal, they're the type of deal that's being offered that first draft that the label gives you rarely is that a take it or leave it. You, you just got you just got to accept it. You know everything is open to negotiation, even what that deal covers. Um, you know you could have a label deal that covers it's a 360 deal that covers the recorded music, your publishing, and gets a, a piece of anything else you do in the entertainment industry, whether it's acting, whether it's you know writing a book, whether it's being on a podcast. 
So there's that type of deal. Then there's other label deals where it might just be the recorded music. You are their recording artist and they're going to give you a percentage of it. Um, and that's, that's kind of more what I like to see more these days because um, the 360 deal really came up about 15 years ago with, with uh, Napster and downloading rising and, and people stopped going to Walmart buying CDs and they said, shit, we need to buy, we need to get as much money as we can in other sources. But if I'm representing an artist and there's a 360 deal and they want to get a piece of, you know, this artist's potential future acting career, I always ask, what relationships do you have in the world of acting that can justify that percentage? You know, if you're just taking a piece for the sake of taking a piece, but you can't actually generate opportunities, I'm not interested in giving you that piece. So that's that. so that's that that's kind of what I, I look for in the in the label side of things. I mean, the management management you can you can do any number of things, and and there's a lot of good examples of artist manager relationships that still work on a handshake. I don't recommend it because you know you you just don't know what what the terms are. What happens if in five years from now, you thought everything was going good and, and the the, uh, the manager said, I'm going to take 10% and then a dispute happens and the manager now says, I was going to take 25, you know, and, and now they have to prove who's actually entitled to what. That can get super messy. So I always like written management contracts. But as far as what you can do with that, you can always... Um, write into those deals what is and is not included. If this is a music manager, again, somebody who only has resources and connections in the music industry, but you are also, you know, a Twitch streamer or you are an actor or you're doing something else in the entertainment vertical, maybe that percent is 10% there and you get a manager that just does acting, that just does film. And you can actually have multiple managers in different verticals. So that's what I like to do in that in that uh, area. Now, I love that. I love that. Because I think, especially with the management side of things, a lot of people just assume, well, you're my manager and you're there for everything. Mm -hmm. right? And I think in some cases, that's even unfair on a manager side because that doesn't allow them to focus. And then you also are judging them up against the progress in an area that they might not even be on for in their head. So to to me, which is I guess no surprise, like everything you're saying is about clarity, <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's cl clearly agree upon these things and have it written down. I do know quite a few people who are on the handshake deals, and uh, so far they're all going good. The ones I know, yeah, the ones um, I know, yeah, yeah, that's, but, but, that's strong so far. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> I, I guess there is all that risk. <laughs> but th the big point that you're making, though, like again, like all right, if I'm acting then I have a, that kind of um, manager. manager, music. Are there any other type of managers an artist might have? Well, a business manager is definitely one that, if you're signed to a big management company, they're gonna require you to have a business manager, somebody that actually collects your money and then cuts the checks to all the people, including your manager, that is uh, running your books and making sure that everything is is done correctly. And a, a business manager is somebody who's essentially a bookkeeper, accountant, you know, does your payroll, keeps that all tidy. And a lot of them usually do it on a, like a 5% um, commission of a, everything that comes in. So a business manager, you know, your personal manager, your artist manager. And then of course, you know, if you're a touring artist, you might have a tour manager, but that's more specific to, you know, your live performances. Business managers take 5% of everything that's coming in. And as everything that you just said was, it sounded very accounting-like, right? Is, do I have that right? Yes, absolutely. Business managers, you should think of them as accountants. They are the ones that are collecting all the money. They might be settling up with, um, you know, reconciling different royalty statements from labels, um, settling up with, with venues making sure that everybody's getting their piece, whether it's the uh, personal manager, whether it's the a producer that you have to pay from an artist producer agreement, you know, whoever the artist owes some 
money to, and it could be a lawyer as well, whoever the artist owes money to, that business manager is going to make sure that that's taken care of. And also there's some like personal money management and advisement that goes in there. You know, hey, you just got this $100,000 advance. This is supposed to cover both your budget of your next record and for you to live for the next two years. Maybe don't go out there and buy, you know, a brand new car. You know, you think about this a little bit differently. I have my main manager. I'm giving him 10 to 20%, right? I can get with that. That makes a lot of sense. If they're supposed to be eating and bringing me opportunities and building infrastructure with me consistently, really it's a co-owner of my business per se, per se, not exactly, but in a sense. But then there's so many other places that artists are giving percentages. And when I hear just percent, 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 to me, it just sounds like a, a bad habit the music industry has versus a need in a lot of cases. Like in any other business, if I'm thinking about how I split up and how I pay for things, if you're on the sales team, right? You're bringing in money and that's your job to bring in money, you're getting commission. But if you're doing more admin work, I'm paying you something fixed, right? So if I'm hearing a more accounting role, why am I paying a business manager, right? To do paperwork on a percentage base versus just a regular flat fee. Like, have you seen people doing something opposite or do you feel that makes sense? Like, tell me about, am, am I tripping? No, I think, I think you're right. And I think every business manager, um, just like every lawyer probably does things a little bit differently. The manage the business managers I've seen do that percentage. And that's really because they are working with artists that are with these major management outfits. And that's a requirement of that management deal to make sure that the manager is getting paid. Um, that that doesn't mean that there isn't some someone that's out there doing hourly or flat fee or anything like that. Can you explain what you mean when you say that's a when you say that's a requirement of that deal to make sure the management gets paid? Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, so say you've got a ma a, a major management company that's signing an artist to to manage and they're giving they're taking 15 to 20% of what the artist brings in. They want to make sure that in exchange for them getting these opportunities, them working, et cetera, that they're getting paid what they're owed. And if it's a smaller artist and there's not that many revenue sources, that might be easy enough for the personal manager to manage themselves without a business manager. But if it's a bigger artist with multiple revenue streams and it's almost a full-time job to keep track of everything that's coming in, touring, publishing, merchandising, you know, every, everything that comes in, then a business manager makes a lot of sense for the, both the personal manager and for the artist. But that's, you know, a little bit outside of what I do as obviously as a lawyer, but I do work really closely with a lot of business managers. So I don't know how they do that. Gotcha. Are those business managers typically a part? So it sounds like they're a part of the management firm. Like it's the same firm, but that's just like, we have business managers. We have day-to-day -day managers. We have, is, is that what it is? Like one management company you're saying? There are, there are situations where that exists, but I'm usually talking about outside um, companies that just do the business management piece of it. Got you. Got you. Okay. But, but I, well, something you said was, was really interesting, fascinating um, about the music industry is obsessed with taking percentages. And it's, it's certainly true in the legal industry too, in, in the music business, you know, it's very common for, for lawyers to take uh, a percentage of a deal that's being negotiated. If the label or the publishing company, whoever's working on that deal, isn't willing to fund the artist's uh, legal bill, then the lawyer will charge a percentage almost as a accommodation to this artist who doesn't have money to pay a lawyer out of pocket. But there, I think there, there's a little bit more, um, I feel like there's a little bit more investment because the lawyer is actively in there negotiating that deal to be the biggest and best it possibly can be. Artists, managers, there is no way you should ever do a regular pre-save campaign again because Forever Fan has Forever Saves, where a fan could pre-save your music one time and then automatically pre-save every song you ever release after that. That's right, forever. And on top of that, Forever Fan has email and texting 
all in one platform. This is built out for artists who don't have huge teams and don't want to get overwhelmed doing too many things in too many different places. So go to foreverfanmusic.com slash no labels. That's no labels with an S and put in the code no labels O2 to get access and try it out for only a dollar. Foreverfan is your go-to place for your marketing needs as an artist so you can stay organized, have your own infrastructure to make it a lot easier to go to the next level. Again, that's foreverfanmusic.com slash no labels and type in the code no labels O2 at checkout to get access for only a dollar. Now back to the episode. You know, I'm, I'm glad you said that, man. One thing I remember hearing really early when I started working in music is somebody told me that the quickest way to get to a label is through a lawyer. Um, <laughs> you know, like, and I've even had people tell me that, like, hey, in a lot of instances, and you go into these buildings, like lawyers will sometimes be even more powerful than the people in the building that maybe even brought your name up or brought you into it. So, just curious to hear your thoughts on that, man. I don't know if you're you're on that side, like if you if you've ever you know kind of done like one of those deals, but just curious to see, um, one, you know. Why is it that you think that's the thinking? Like how are how you know why are people kind of looking at lawyers as the top dogs in a situation where you would expect like you know the head of A and R or like the VP of A and R or something to be controlling um, or control the situation? And then two, um, is that a route that a lot of lawyers take? Like are are there a lot of lawyers who are like you know I'm sure in it to do good legal work, but are they really just A and Rs with a law degree? You know what I'm saying? Does, does, am I making sense? Yeah, absolutely. So let me let me start with that that first piece of it. Um, as far as the lawyer being the one to, um, why is the lawyer playing this role here, and why are they um, getting involved in potentially it's like an A and R piece? The lawyer's uh, footprint in an artist that they're representing, the time could be pretty short, but it can be really impactful. And so that lawyer can work with dozens, hundreds of artists and see every single type of deal on a pretty regular basis from a label deal to a touring deal to a merchandising deal. They, they get a lot more uh, visibility on all the different types of things that are out there, more so than what an artist, uh, one single artist or manager might see in their career. So the lawyer does get to play in a lot of different sandboxes, uh, so to speak, in the, in the music industry. But you bring up a good point about the lawyer's role in like a record deal or introducing. It's certainly something that happens. You know, I I now negotiating a deal with Sony or Universal or whatever. I've now struck up a friendship with somebody who's an AR, somebody who's in the legal department. You know, I I know those people and I can pass off a client if it's the right fit. But you've hit on something that's the major labels biggest lie that they tell artists. If you just call cold called Sony and you said, I'm an artist, I want to set up a meeting. I want a record deal. The first thing they'll say to you is we don't take unsolicited calls, but call us back with an entertainment lawyer and we'll be happy to take your submission. That doesn't mean that they want you to call back with a lawyer and they're going to give you a deal. That means that they don't think you're going to go through that hoop of hiring a lawyer. So they're just going to kick you, you know, kick you to the curb. So that's, that is a, a common myth too. Not to say that lawyers don't play that role and haven't ever got uh, a client a meeting or a, a deal, but it's also a double-edged sword where the, the label is, is just thinking most people are too lazy to probably call a lawyer and to, to try to reach out that way. Mm. So y'all are like the barrier because they know the price is gonna deter probably at least ninety percent of people. You know what I'm saying? That's smart. That's it smart. makes it does make sense, yeah, right? It does make sense, because yeah. it's qualifying. <laughs> it's like, well, if they actually do come with a lawyer, there's a, some level of seriousness. There might be more together. If the Money. Lawyers probably aren't gonna call a label with some BS. They would advise, no, I'm not gonna call and put my name on it, right? <laughs> so I think there's that's that's probably pretty smart on their part because I do find. Like l lawyers to be at the intersection of two things that are primary in the music industry. And that's paperwork and people, right? Over and over again, it always leads back to that. Like you get a lot of things without money done if you know the right people, right? Or open a lot of doors. And then obviously the paperwork 
is going to be the thing that shoots you in the foot, depending on how it goes. Right. Um, so like for you, for you as a lawyer in this industry, have you seen, um, do you feel like for artists understand the value of a lawyer, um, enough beyond, Hey, when it's time to sign a contract, you technically probably should have one to make sure you're not getting screwed over. But do you think most artists understand the value that lawyers have beyond just that technical aspect of things? I don't think that most artists understand the value of having a lawyer beyond just the deal. There, a lot of people, a lot of artists think that the best time to call a lawyer is when they've already been in a bad deal and things are going sideways and they need to call a lawyer to get out of that bad deal. You know, the easiest way to get out of a bad deal is to get in the time machine and never sign it in the first place, because you can only get out if there is a legal basis to get out. If there was some requirement that the label was supposed to do that they're not meeting and the label gives you that out. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's get out of it. But for the most part, it's just artists that sign these terrible deals thought I I can save a few bucks, not having a lawyer look at it. I think I know everything that it says in here anyway, I'll go go ahead and sign it. That's where you get into a lot of trouble. Yes. I mean, I guess, you know, assuming you're an artist career is moving, you know, you, you get to a point to where maybe you're doing a couple of deals a year. Like you said, that that's when they usually are reaching out. So, I mean, what's the cadence that you're kind of recommending to your clients? Like, how often do you have your clients check in and just talk to you? I'm assuming maybe about, like, career updates or things like that outside of the deals. Like, what does that look like? Absolutely. I, I, think, I think there's a lot of benefit to talking to a lawyer really early on in your career, as long as you don't confuse their role with a manager or an agent. You know, most lawyers aren't out there to get you deals. They're here to do legal work and to advise you. So even a new baby artist that's just starting out, I would recommend they get an LLC. You know, you are going to limit your personal liability protection. You are going to get some tax benefits and you should have like, you know, you should have a business around your music business. And then I also think that we start developing what are these different areas of your music monetization? Are you signed up with a PRO? Do you know what the MLC and sound exchange are? Do all your song songs that you've written, do you have split sheets? Do you have producer agreements with your producers? Um, is everything kind of papered before you put music out? Before we even talk about anybody coming to the table with a potential deal, is everything pretty clean, cleaned up and tidy? You know, do you, have you registered for your federal copyright? I, I can't, or, or your trademark. I can't tell you how many people have said, you know, somebody just released a new album. They stole my, my name and, and that's, that's my name. I need them to take it down. I said, do you have a trademark? You know, is that actually your name? Have you federally registered it? Because if you haven't, those rights are a lot weaker. So there's, there's a lot that, that can be done before we're talking about deals. But then to your point about what kind of cadence, anytime an artist is potentially signing a deal that has some long-term consequences, that's when you need to have a lawyer take a look at it. If you're having a, you know, you're going to play a local show and it's going to be a couple hundred bucks and you're going to play it for one night, maybe not something you need a lawyer to look at. But if somebody's trying to get a piece of your entire music catalog and they're they want to control it for the next 15 years absolutely have a lawyer take a look at that that makes me think the the naming part in particular like i've had a few people that i've worked with or just known that will have the same name as somebody that's in another country and you know the other artists will randomly catch a hit or and that's when they first find out about them and now they're wondering what they should do they're either going through a name change and have to go through that headache on dsps and some of them are trying to stick it out um like are there like a is there like a worldwide name trademark that protects you one like from a legal side and then two uh, do you have any suggestion in that type of case like hey man you're not that big yet so it'll be easier to do it now and later like what, what are your thoughts on that type of scenario so whether we're talking about copyright, whether we're talking about trademark, 
in for an artist in the United States, those protections through registration are really only going to protect you in the borders of the United States. But that doesn't mean that they aren't going to be respected by other countries because we have treaties with all these other countries that have very similar intellectual property rights. You know, the UK might say in exchange for you recognizing the US, in exchange for you recognizing the validity of one of our artist copyrights, you know, we're going to allow X, Y, Z to happen if it if it happens in your borders, but it's, it's stealing one of our artist songs. Um, the thing that's kind of cruel and, and difficult for artists to reconcile is that you as the owner of your name, of your songs, of your recordings, you are responsible for policing your own music and your own copyrights, your own trademarks. And what I mean by that is you are deemed to have known what exists out there. And if you don't protect yourself from somebody else using it within a certain amount of time, you might lose those rights or you may weaken the rights that you have. So you constantly have to be out there monitoring what's out there in the world and, and taking action when necessary. Mm, that's crazy. Mm. So I wanna get into a couple other scenarios that I've heard you talk about. Um, one being the Bad Bunny situation which I didn't know about until learning about it from you, where a fan, well, a fan recorded Bad Bunny at his concert and Bad Bunny sued him. Initially, my thoughts was like, yo, that's kind of bad for fan culture, but you you, you kind of won me out and I felt like the fan probably deserved it. Can you like, speak more on that case? Absolutely. So there was a fan that recorded a Bad Bunny concert and he recorded about a third of the entire concert and he posted it on YouTube. So we're not talking about, you know, a 30 second clip that he put on TikTok or Instagram. He put you know, a good chunk of this 10 whole songs on a monetized YouTube account, which is pretty tough. And then Bad Bunny's team just tried to do a copyright strike said, Hey, this violates our copyrights. All we ask is that you take it down because we are the owners of this. It's, it's harmful to the brand. It's harmful to uh, being able to monetize this because some fans, I mean, it looks, it looks like a camera shot concert, but there certainly are some people out there that would say, why do I need to see the Bad Bunny show now that I've seen it on YouTube? You know, the, or or they might say, I kind of wanted to go see it, but once I saw that YouTube video, it didn't look that good. So why would I pay X amount of dollars for a ticket when it comes through my my city? So Bad Bunny's team reached out to them through a YouTube copyright strike and just took it offline and said, we own this, just, just stop doing it. And that should have been the end of it. And that's where, um, you know, most of these times where a major label or an artist sues a fan or somebody that's infringing, they always give the other side the opportunity to stop doing something. Just walk away. We're not going to ask for any money. Just stop. And when people don't stop, then they, they give them no other choice. So the way that the takedown system works under the U.S. Copyright Act is the DSPs and the social media have what is known as a safe harbor. They can't be personally liable for somebody on YouTube posting something that infringes somebody else's copyright if once they hear about that, they immediately take action and take that down. But you've got this 14-day period. So they got to take it down, and they've, and they've done that. But you've got this 14-day period where they investigate, and the person who had originally posted it that gets taken down, gets to make a counterclaim or a defense and says, well, I actually think this is mine for X, Y, Z reasons. This poster said, I think it's mine because of fair use, which fair use is, is its, it's, its own thing, but it definitely didn't apply here because he was trying to monetize it and it wasn't any of his, his own music. So, if, if you want to keep something down beyond that 14 days under the takedown procedures, you have no choice but to file a lawsuit to show the YouTube, we've got this court case, here's the, here's the case caption, here's the number, here's everything to keep this down. 
So it's not so much a money grab because it's very possible that this fan doesn't have the $1.5 million that they're seeking. And that is also statutory. It's not like they just picked that number out of a hat. It's $150,000 per willful infringement. And he did it for 10 songs. So it's 1.5 million. But I don't really think that they're trying to collect or go the full distance on that. They just had no other choice but to do that to keep that music offline. It's interesting you said it, right? Like, I don't think they want to take it that far. It it feels like the industry taking a stance against fan entitlement, right? Because when I was watching the whole case, you know, and I've seen the sentiment online where fans are like, hey, like, I've already spent so much money on you. I deserve this. Or, hey, you made it for us. You know what I'm saying? So it's technically me. And I think that just because of where socials are, and where content is, is is probably one of the first times we've seen artists be very vocal about like, nah, fuck y'all. Like, you know what I'm saying? This is for me, this is on my terms and my thing. So this case almost felt like Bad Bunny and his team sending a message to his fans and saying like, hey, this is my ship. I run this how I want to run it. And when I'm ready for the world to see it, you know, everything could be all peachy keen and hunky dory. And if y'all step out of line, this is what that looks like. You know what I'm saying? Hundred percent agree. It sends a great <laughs> message too. Yeah, for sure, for sure. A lot of fans definitely won't be trying that. Yeah, I, I wonder if it was just <laughs> like a kid, you know, or you know, person who just posted. They're probably not used to it. Like if it wasn't like even a big YouTube page like that. Do you know if it was a bigger page or a smaller page? I don't know, um, but I do know that the quality was actually pretty good. You know, from like the equipment that he used, the the microphones that he used, it wasn't just iPhone. It was like potentially a DSLR with like a you know an ex- external microphone. And yeah, so yeah, he's he's doing official bootleg, and that that's a little different. That's a little different. I understand <laughs> that then. I mean, shoot, speaking of those types of cases, then, because you just said something interesting, right? They will give you a chance to take it down, right? To make a change. And we've been hearing a lot about the Trey Fago case and how that's been turning out. They owe Sony eight eight hundred thousand dollars right? Based on how things got decided in court. Can you speak more about that situation in general? Like, do, do you know that someone, did Sony reach out and try to say, hey, let's make a deal on the song or get pay us something particular and everything will be good. And he just didn't take the deal. Like, how did it get to this point? Part of the problem is that in looking into this case, it's still kind of hard to determine who Troy Fuego is. It's not like he's, there's a lot of information of him online. What do you say? It's hard to determine who he is, period. Right. Yeah. Like I, if you Google who he is, like you can't even find his legal name. So that was one of the big problems about this case. They were trying to even get in touch with him and they, and they couldn't, he kept ignoring them. And, you know, it was, it was one of those things that they tried to reach out and try to um, come up with some type of deal. Anytime you have a uncleared sample and the song does really well, the last thing that a label is going to want to do, unless there's some other reason to object to that use, like, you know, the um, the Kanye and the Donna Summer and the Ozzy Osbourne stuff, that's that that aside. But if you have like a Trey Fuego and the song is doing well and it's making money, labels are typically pretty smart. And they're going to say, I think there's probably a chance to partner here and to make some money off of this. And we'll come in 50-50. And we'll also ask for some percentage of the amount that's already been collected on the song. And that's usually how that kind of gets all cleared up on the back end, unless they just want, want it taken down for some reason. But here, let's assume that they tried that. It didn't go anywhere. They were in a position where they were forced to sue because, again, they didn't hear back. Didn't He didn't reach a deal. And then they took it down they did the DMCA takedown and then they were had to file a lawsuit to keep it offline. And they had this judge and this was in the federal district court of Texas. And this judge was pretty hardcore. Um, he was not a fan of 
the fact that this artist very intentionally stole this song and didn't try to work out any type of deal and didn't even participate in this case. You know, most people, you know, when they get sued, they try to fight it. You know, they tried to put on some type of defense and, and he didn't put any, any type of effort in there. And the judge, I mean, he was evading service. They would try to find him and like sheriffs and private process service, you try to serve him and he would just, you know, keep evading that service. And so finally the judge in that case said, we'll allow you to serve this defendant through an Instagram direct message which is just wild because if I'm, if I'm filing a lawsuit, I have to give it to a sheriff a marshal or some private process process server that's appointed by the court to physically deliver process to the defendant and get that like an affidavit that that actually happened. So for a judge to say this direct message, it's good enough. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. But anyway, he he gets they say that that's good enough and he's he's served and he doesn't participate at all there's all these motions that are filed he doesn't participate in it they keep asking for that money because it isn't just some again it isn't just some number that they pulled out of a hat it is the estimation of what that song generated so they're asking because you stole that song we're asking for you to turn over those profits cuz you got that from from theft essentially and i think you know whether or not that's going to go anywhere oh was that would that be a hundred percent they project that that's a hundred percent of the money like we want all the money back at this point since you haven't participated or is that still like a percentage that'd be a hundred percent but if i was that guy if i was that guy i'd say look i'll just file bankruptcy right now and the whole thing goes away (laughs) i mean he's already this deep in in this direction you know, I I mean, it seems so ill-advised where it could have came out like better and clearer and you could have built a little bit more of a career off of it and, and still been going and still had the money from the song. Like you said, the, the labels weren't probably going to take away all of the money, probably a really big portion. Like you said, 50%. I wouldn't be surprised if more, but I don't know. This is such an odd case, man. I, I don't. Did you see that the song was taken down? from his page but then it was re-uploaded again from some other mystery account did you see that yeah i I did see that what do you you think is happening there i think and i've seen this from time to time i think that they're basically copycats that people will find these songs and they don't have any ownership of it or any claim to it and it'll get taken down and they know that it's popular and they'll re-upload it and try to make some money off of it. The same thing happened with the um, Drake, the weekend hard on our sleeves, AI song that gets taken off. And then multiple people start reposting it in all these different places, even though they weren't the person who who created it. So you think it's more like opportunist troll or something, not Trey necessarily uploading it again on the side or something. Yeah. I think it's troll. This is, I don't know, man. This is, it's just so weird. It's so weird to, duck court and all those things unless he has some other stuff going on where he feels like i don't want to see the police at all you know or, or something it's about for four years bro. yeah for four years <laughs> just to not be served about about this i don't know it seems so ill-advised it seems so ill-advised and a bigger opportunity missed but maybe that money seeing that money come in just like the mentality might just be like oh yeah i'm not sharing anything i i hit a lick or something i i don't know man that's that that's so crazy. That's so crazy. I can't I can't really be on the, the artist side on that one. The yeah. label kind of has. Oh that. yeah, no, he definitely fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very hard. Dude. Like I don't understand how the fans are taking his side. Fans don't know, but it's, it's very hard to know even a little bit and just be on his side, bro. And if you see this, all right, bro, you know it is what it is. <laughs> but that uh, but that makes me think, man, because what he did and how he handled that moment. I guess let's say pre Sony reaching out, right? Is something that I've seen be advised to people before, right? Where like, hey, if you're in a situation mm-hmm. where, you know, maybe there's an unclear sample, there's a, a an instrumental or something like that, and you don't think we have the rights to it, hey man, just do your thing and 
I've even had somebody say to me, like, hey, bro, if you get hit with a lawsuit, that means you're doing things right. That means you 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 got big enough to where they actually care enough about you in that regard. I can imagine it has to be stressful as a lawyer looking at the space to like the internet content space of that and some of that advice getting pushed out and seeing that artists are willfully engaging in something that could put them in a very similar situation. Because I think Trey Fagel is the best and worst case example of that. Right? Like, hey, you had this song that did take the fuck off and you don't have to go through all these loopholes to get it there. But look at what you're going through down the line. Because you know, we was even doing the math later. I, I had a friend that guesstimated that Sony probably asked him for like 70%. And so me and Sean did the math. I was like, damn, bro. So, you know, he would have to give up like 600K. You still would have kept 200, you know what I'm saying? Assuming things went the way it went. Now you got to give all of it back, right? And I can imagine there's at least 50 more hymns out there that are probably getting ready to pop in and be in a very, very similar situation. But they probably heard people say like, hey, just fuck it. Just do what you got to do until the song hits. That you're you're hitting the nail on the head with another thing where the industry standards do not follow the law. So I, as a lawyer, am always like, always get, clearances samples cleared and loops cleared ahead of time and think about it this way you know if he reached out to sony and they have licensing clearance departments of course they do every every label does if he reached out to them as this independent artist who had zero monthly listeners and he said i've got this song and they liked they liked the song and he said what would it be to clear this they probably would have quoted him something like $2,500, $5,000, something pretty minimal, and he would have been good to go. But when you wait for something, if you say, I'll get around to clearing it, even though that's how the industry typically does it, if you wait around until it hits, now you've given them all the data. They've got all the ammunition they need because they know exactly how much money is being made. So they don't just want their standard licensing fee for this unknown artist and the song that may or may not do anything they want a big chunk of this hit and you're you're pretty much like at the mercy of doing what they say you're going to do or like trey fuego f facing a copyright infringement lawsuit and the the saddest thing about that case for me is that song was a huge hit there's over 170 million streams that is technically a platinum record if we're talking about streams these days because 75 million streams is a gold record if it's certified. So you had a platinum record as this indie artist and there was probably a path for Sony to come in to take some things. You, you now get a certified platinum record and, and you are now fielding new offers, new opportunities. Maybe there was even a deal with Sony to be had. Yeah. But you, you you botched it. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely enough movement. We know how this industry works. Plenty of people will hop out the woodworks, managers, <laughs> labels, to be able to try to like nurture that situation and make it bigger than what it already was. So definitely a botch on that part. Like I said, I, I wonder if there's, I don't know, something that we're completely missing. But I'm not gonna lie. If I go to Young indie Sean brain, uh, brain. If I'm an artist, all right, and I hear everything that you just said, the way I hear the situation is, oh yeah, I'm still gonna put out a track anyway, <laughs> without getting it cleared because I don't have the upfront money. If I'm gonna create a hundred songs, I only really, really want to have to pay for the one that pops. And if they do want to come charge me for these ones that didn't pop, which they probably wouldn't. I mean, it wouldn't be much money to split anyway, but the one that pops, okay, I'm just not going to be like this trade guy and I'm going to say, yes, I'm going to answer the phone and I'll let them get a percentage and then I'll flip my brand off of that. That's what like a young indie artist Sean would do if I was like, you know, 19 years old or something. So I would love to hear your retort to that. Okay, so there's two there's two problems with the, the young Sean approach. Okay, <laughs> one is it used to be a lot easier to get away with copyright infringement, both from a cultural perspective and from a just technological 
perspective. Before the Blurred Lines case, you know, for the last 50 years, people were pretty cool with sampling in hip hop and really just reusing and being inspired by things. And then that case really changed things where we're a lot more sensitive to copyright and we're a lot more litigious. So everything changed 10, 11, 11 years ago as far as what is and isn't acceptable for better or for worse. But then the other thing is you used to be able to get away with it. You know, there, there were so many songs out there that you had to have found that song for you to even know that somebody had stolen it or used it with AI that all changes. There's this tool called CoverNet where you upload your entire discography and it scans the whole song and it even creates stems, AI stems. Like they'll know if it's your voice, if it's your drum beat, if it's your, you know, violin, if it's your guitar, they'll know all these different things. And if any of that, including just a clone of your voice, is used anywhere on any of the DSPs, social media, et cetera, without your credit, your compensation, without your, you know, permission you're going to be able to take that down and find it pretty immediately. So you, you no longer really have that opportunity to kind of just like skate by and say, well, if, if nobody knows about it and it doesn't blow up, it's not going to be an issue. Hey, well, no. Yeah, that's you know, crazy. I mean, I guess it's good overall. You know what I'm saying? I meant good, but crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sheesh. They got to find a new way in, in this era. To figure out their way up. Well, I guess that's create original music. I feel like it's easier said than done. You know, <laughs> at this stage, you know what I'm saying? Because even yeah, like, did, yeah, even the the trade situation, man. Like, what's so sad about it to me? Because I was telling Sean, I I got hip to the case maybe like three days ago, and the song was still on his account. He was at maybe like two point eight three million monthly listeners. We checked it right before this episode. The song is down. He's dropped down to like 80,000 monthly listeners. So we're talking about like, I don't even know the math on that. Crazy thousands of percent decrease. And I can imagine that song's probably 95% of his catalog, but then even the trickle over to the rest of his music, you know what I'm saying? It was probably crazy. So it's like, I don't know. I think it's a great example of how, because I don't think, I don't think enough indie artists progress Further, further enough along in their career to see the results of their bad decisions, and which I think is a part of the issue, right? You have 20,000 artists telling you that this thing is okay, but they've never progressed to the position to where that thing is no longer okay. So in their head, they're right, right? Like, you'll be okay. Like, this isn't going to happen. But then it's like, it takes that one that breaks through to the other side for everybody to see, like, oh, no, they really take this seriously. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is... And it makes sense to me because if you think about What's so interesting about music is that it's probably the only industry where majority of the people that want to get in it don't understand the industry. I've, I've never really seen that in any other industry. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it makes sense, you know, a kid wakes up every day and wants to be a music artist, but that doesn't mean that he's suddenly, you know, um, basking in this great thirst for knowledge, <laughs> you know, about the industry and things like that. But I do think as sad as it is, it, it, it is a warning to artists of like, hey, like, don't think that, you know, little Sean's decisions today, you know, if you go as far as you think you're going to go, then you're really shooting yourself in the foot. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. And, and what and what artist doesn't think they're going to blow up, right? I mean, that's kind of the delusion that you need to have to be a successful artist. Because if some artist, like, was told of, if they were visited by their future self and they're like, man, you're going to get kicked down every single day. It sucks. You're underpaid. You're underappreciated, you know, whatever they might not want to do it. But, you know, most artists that I see that become successful have that fuck you mentality. I'm going to do what I need to do because I know I'm different. There's 120,000 songs uploaded to the DSPs each day. And my song is going to be the one that pops. You know, and that's what it that's what it really takes. So, you know, if if you are planning for that, you know, don't think so small. Don't think mine won't be the 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 problem. You know, always plan for for doing it the right way so you're covered when you do blow up. I mean, so that, that makes me think of something, man. So, you know, you talked about the, the Robin Thicke case changed things with that. Um, you know, me and Sean talked about it. I feel like we're in the era of 
legal change in music is like a new lawsuit or case, you know what I'm saying? Popping up, it feels like every couple of months. It's kind of a chicken or the egg question. Who do you feel like is responsible for change in the industry? Is it the job of the artist to become aware and speak out? Or is it the job of the business people to push that forward and make everyone aware? How do you feel being on your side of things? I mean, it really is. It really is both. You need to have enough people on both sides of the industry, the artist side and the business side of it that really care about changing the way things are done because that's just the way it's been done is no longer good enough. You know, the idea of the companies owning masters forever and just paying artists a 15% royalty after millions of dollars are, are recouped that doesn't make sense anymore. And you've got deals that are looking a lot better, even, even deals that are coming from major labels that are, are looking a lot more fair and looking more like partnerships that are more 50-50 deals, that are more licensing deals instead of in perpetuity master ownership. But it comes down to, to both. You know, If artists are willing to accept shitty deals, there's, they're going to keep feeding us shitty deals. You know, it, it doesn't matter uh, how how good of a job a lawyer does if the the artist at the end of the day says the money is too good, the opportunity is too good. I still want to do it. I, I hear what you're saying, but I want that deal. So it it comes down to both artists standing up for themselves, educating themselves, empowering themselves, knowing what they can ask for. But also on the other side, it requires the business, the label to start changing the way that they are doing business and, and, and pushing it more towards a more equitable partnership than just a, I own what you create. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. That's a beautiful place to end it. Ryan, I appreciate your time, man. It's been so dope having you on. Um, we're definitely, everybody y'all know, y'all could look on the screen if you're watching on uh, YouTube on how to follow him. Uh, it'll be on the description. Spotify, it'll be in the details. But <laughs> <laughs> this is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary. I'm Brad Van Sean. And I'm Corey. Yeah, and we out. Peace. <laughs> Appreciate you for watching. If you like content like this, you'll love seeing our music marketing strategies that we use as an agency to actually blow up artists to millions and even billions of streams that are available for free at nolabelsnecessary.com. And the cool part about it that's going to really make you love it is we don't have to be all entertaining and add all this fluff just to get some views that we do on YouTube. We get straight to the information. There's play by play and courses that give you a breakdown of every step that you should do to get success. And you have the ability to have communication with us. We get on live talks, a lot of cool things for members, and it's free just to hop in. So check it out right now at nolabelsnecessary.com.